about. Welcome to uh, the Saturday morning wake up call right here on KFAR. It's hour one, basically, of the uh, Patriots' lament, and we are here today, as we are every week, to uh, stir up something deep inside you to get you to question what it means to be free. Are you really free? Do you do you know what freedom really is? Do you live like a free man? If you are free to complain about something, but you never complain, what good does having the freedom to do so mean? I'm curious. Josh Bennett is joining us here in the studio on the other side from... Uh, Don't make me start party. thinking so early. Hey, look, this is what the... This, this, you got to get up earlier, get yourself some coffee, and get those thinking juices flowing. But Down a couple Mountain Dews. Exactly. Or three or four, whatever it takes. But seriously, though, I mean, you, you, you read me a quote here that you read on the Walk All this week about we mustn't complain while we have the right to do so. Right. What, what is that's the general, the point of it was that's the general consensus of American people is why, why are you complaining? You're free to complain. In other words, why exercise your liberty while you have them? I guess we should complain when they're all taken away. Then you'd have the right to complain. I don't well, there, there's this line in the sand that a lot of people have drawn around the Second Amendment, that somehow once they repeal that amendment, <laughs> that's the one that now all of a sudden we're going to stand up for. <clears throat> but it, it, if you're not using your right to keep and bear arms now, who cares if they take that away from you? It's the same thing if you're not using your right to free speech. Exactly. Use it while you got it. Use it or lose it. Nah, we shouldn't be able to lose it. I wanted to bring up last week's call um, because it got kind of a stir after the show. My brother was accosted by a few people about it. And I can understand. The the one I wanted to talk about is a good caller. I agreed most of everything the guy said. He was talking about the political elite, the rich, elitist, new world orderist, dominant folks that are running the world and how they are the problem and while i agree that i have no doubt that there are rich elitists that want to rule the world and are pulling the strings for this war that war this economy or that economy they're running basically maybe running the world to a point but I don't think, and it's not just my opinion, our point that we were trying to make was that no one person has so much power over how many billions of people are on the earth. When we listen to Glenn Beck, he likes to talk about old George Soros, because the guy's what got several billion dollars, I guess. Most of it, some of it has come by probably good gain. Obviously, some of it's come by currency manipulation and whatnot. And he's obviously been behind some of the political goings-ons in our country and U.S. politics. And he points the finger at the guy and says, this guy is the problem. Look at this guy. And yet, even Barack Obama or George Bush before him, one man is the problem. Or is it the 300 million people that are going along with his agenda or his problem? And I have thought about this a lot over years. We blame certain peoples, individuals. It's easy to do. I think like with blaming the, the rich elitist, it's easy to do because we don't know any of them. There's no conviction to do anything about them because... You know, I can complain about some Rothschild somewhere or a Bilderberger or whatever and just, I'm not denying that they exist. But it's easy to complain about them because there's nothing so-called that I can do about it. So that's who I will point the finger at and say, aha, if it wasn't for these rich rulers that are trying to turn us into a one world order, then blah, 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 and they're going to get their way because, uh, whatever reason why, because, because... We will allow it to happen. 
the one man has no, what, he's got money? So, just say he owns trillions of dollars. He owns economy, whatever. He doesn't actually. He can't control economy. Everything is a human action. We go about our daily lives. Our actions are what make what happened in our daily lives happen. Our actions in economy are what makes our economy good or bad. I mean, personal economy. What some rich guy does in, I don't know where they hang out. Probably Germany, because they're bad. Or used to be bad. Wherever these folks hang out or like to be around, these world elitist, one world orderist, blah, blah, blahs, they have no effect. They literally have no effect or power. The only power they have is what we allow them to do to us. We have two or three billion people in the world, and we're worried about... Let's just say there's a hundred of them. Let's say there's a million of them. We have almost seven billion people in North America. Oh, is it seven? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just thinking of China. <laughs> you bring, bring you back up into the, the modern day. Here. Yeah. There's almost seven billion people on the planet. Okay, there's seven billion people. So we're worried about a handful of elites ruling us. And what can these handful of elites do without our consent? I'm just, I, it seems to me that if you blame a person that you don't personally know and that you personally could do nothing about because he's either too powerful or too far away or just you don't know him. Non-existent. It, 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 well, exactly. Basically. I mean, it comes, it gets to that point where it, 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 no matter how far out you go, whether you go to the Roth, Rothschilds or the Bilderbergers or what is the thing that Alex Jones is always talking about that he goes and he... Bohemians. Goes, yeah. That... It, oh, they do up, have those. It, it removes the personal responsibility. Sure. It is no longer my problem. I can't do anything about it. Because these people are rich. It's it's that person's fault that things are in this state. Right. It's not my fault. It's I, I don't have any personal responsibility to do anything about it. I think that's what happens when you start thinking in terms of a one man or one group solution. It's the same thing that we saw during the political season with people blaming Barack Obama. For yeah. the problems that we're having, or, or saying, or, look for a one-man solution the other way. What we need is a good leader. Mm -hmm. What we need to just get the right person in office, Josh. Well, we'd look at these world elitist power mongers. Like I said, I don't deny that there's, these people exist. But what about little people across the the river here in the borough? What power do they have over us? They pass laws and put their little thumb on us at all times. Decide what our property values are. Decide what monies we'll give them. Decide what the uh, different things they'll spend the money on will be. We don't get to decide those things. I don't personally get to decide where the money that the borough spends goes. We would say, well, it's because you're not politically involved. Well, how many of you are politically involved with the borough? You go down there every Thursday, and the money's spent the way that you wish it to be spent. The amount of money that's taken from you is the amount that you wish for it to be taken from. It's simply because we allow them to do it. And I'm not just talking... Let's go... I'm going to back, back up here a little bit. This, this question was asked... And, well, it's been asked throughout ages, but the particular one I want to bring up question was asked in 1552 or 3, 1552, by Etienne de la Boatie, French dude, at the ripe old age of 22. Because what do 22-year-olds have to do besides talk about the discourse of voluntary servitude and the politics of obedience? 22 years old. So he asks the same question. How is it that one or two of these men, these great people, can rule hundreds, thousands, millions? I'm going to read a couple different things from him, but we'll start out with this one. Our nature is such that the common duties of human relationships occur a great part of the course of our life. That is 22. That's pretty... It's, We've mentioned this several times. Please read this. And think about a 22-year-old that you know today. And think about this old boy. It is reasonable to love virtue, 
to esteem good deeds, to be grateful for good for whatever source it may receive it, we may receive it, and often to give up some of our comfort in order to increase the honor and advantage of some man whom we love and who deserves it. Therefore, if the inhabitants of a country have found some great personage who has shown rare foresight in protecting them in an emergency, think of any natural disaster, rare boldness in defending them, rare solicitude in governing them, and if from that point on they contract the habit of obeying him and depending on him to such an extent that they grant him certain prerogatives, I fear that such a procedure is not prudent inasmuch as they remove him from a position in which he was doing good and advance him to a dignity in which he may now do evil. Certainly, certainly, while he continues to manifest good, will one need fear no harm from a man who seems to be generally well disposed. But, O good Lord, what strange phenomenon is this? What name shall we give it? What is the nature of this misfortune? What vice is it? Or rather, what is what degradation? Degradation. To see an endless multitude of people not merely obeying, but driven to servility? Not ruled, but tyrannized over? These wretches have no wealth, no kin, nor wife, nor children, not even life itself that they can call their own. They suffer plundering, wantonness, cruelty, not from an army, not from a barbarian horde, on account who they must shed their blood and sacrifice their lives, but from a single man. Not from a Hercules, nor from a Samson, but from a single little man. Too frequently the same little man is the most cowardly and effeminate in the nation. A stranger to the power of battle and hesitant on the sands of the tournament, not only without energy to direct men by force, but with hardly enough virility to bed with even a common woman. Shall we call subjection subjection to such a leader cowardice? Shall we say that those who serve him are cowardly and faint-hearted? If two, if three, if four do not defend themselves from the one, we might call that circumstance surprisingly but nonetheless conceivable. In such a case, one might be justified in suspecting a lack of courage. But if a man, no, but if a hundred, if a thousand endure the caprice of a single man, should we not rather say that they lack not the courage but the desire to rise against him? And that such an attitude indicates indifference rather than cowardice? Would not a hundred, not a thousand men, but a hundred provinces, a thousand cities, a million men refuse to assail a single man from whom the kindest treatment received is the infliction of serfdom and slavery, what shall we call it then? Is it cowardice? Of course there is every vice inevitably some limit beyond which one cannot go. Two, possibly ten, may fear one, but when a thousand, a million men, a thousand cities fail to protect themselves against the domination of one man, this could not be called cowardly, for cowardice does not sink to such a depth, any more than valor can be termed the effort of one individual to scale a fortress, to attack an army, or to conquer a kingdom. What monstrous, monstrous vice, then, is this that does not even deserve to be called cowardice, a vice to which no term can be found vile enough, which nature herself disavows and our tongues refuse to name? Place on one side 50,000 armed men, and on the other the same number. Let them join in battle, one side fighting to retain its liberty, the other to take it away. To which would you, at a guess, promise victory? I would venture the ones fighting for their liberty. Which men do you think would march more gallantly to combat? Those who anticipate as reward their suffering, the maintenance of their freedom, or those who cannot expect any other prize for their blows exchanged in the enslavement of someone else, of others? One side will have before its eyes the blessings of the past and the hope of the similar joy of the future. Their thoughts will dwell less on the comparatively brief pain of battle than that of which they may endure forever. They, their children, and all of their prosperity. Posterity, sorry. The other side has nothing to inspire with courage except the weak urge of greed, which fades before danger, which can never be so keen, it seems to me, that it would not be dismayed by the least drop of blood from wounds. Consider the justly famous battles of... Pfft, I don't even know these words. Me and artist know that one. Still fresh today in recorded history. Of course, this is 600 years ago. And in the minds of men, as if they occurred but yesterday, battles fought in Greece for the welfare of the Greeks and as an example of the world. What power do you think 
gave to such a mere handful of men not the strength but the courage to withstand the attack of a fleet so vast that even the seas were burdened, and to defeat the armies of so many nations, armies so immense that the officers alone outnumbered the entire Greek force? What was it but the fact of those glorious days this struggle represented not so much a fight of Greeks against Persians as a victory of liberty over domination, of freedom over greed? It amazes us to hear accounts of the valor that liberty arouses in the hearts of those who defend it, but who could believe reports of what goes on every day among the inhabitants of those same countries? Who could really believe that one man alone may mistreat a hundred thousand to deprive them of their liberty? <coughs> Excuse me. Who would credit such a report if he merely heard it without being present to witness the event? And if this condition occurred only in distant lands and, we report, and were reported to us, which one among us would not assume the tale to be imagined or invented and not really true? Obviously, there is no need of fighting to overcome this single tyrant, for he is automatically defeated. If the country refuses to consent to, his own, to its own enslavement, it is not necessary to deprive him of anything, but simply to give him nothing. There is no need that a country make an effort to do anything for itself, provided it does nothing against itself. It is therefore the inhabitants themselves who permit, or rather bring about, their own subjection, since by ceasing to submit, they would end, they would put an end to their servitude. A people enslaves itself, cuts its own throat, when having a choice between the vassals of being free men, it deserts its liberty and takes on a yoke, gives consent to its own misery, or rather apparently welcomes it. If it costs the people anything to recover its freedom, I should not urge action to this end. Although there is nothing a human should hold more dear than the restoration of his own natural right, change himself from a beast of burden back to a man. I do not demand of him so much boldness. Let him prefer the doubtless security of living wretchedly to the uncertain hope as he pleases. What then? If in order to have liberty nothing more is needed than to long for it, if only a simple act of the will is necessary, is there any nation in the world that considers a single wish too high a price to pay in order to recover the rights which ought to be ready to redeem at the cost of its blood, rights which shall rights such that their loss must bring all men of honor to the point of feeling life to be unendurable and death itself a deliverance? Wow. Etienne de la Poitie? Mm hmm. That's, you know, it's interesting to think about how people back then were able to think through the issues. And I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that they just took the time to think. I'll, I'll be willing to wager that Etienne de la Boite didn't spend a lot of time playing Halo. I doubt it. Or killing any zombies. Yeah, I, I doubt I think it. The, I think he wrote it when he was doing his seminary. I have to research that. But he was 22 years old. And this is what was going through his mind. And certainly he wasn't the only person that was thinking about it because, you know, we usually sit around and think about what we've talked to our buddies about or our friends or whatever, the relationships that we have. We usually ponder on things that we discuss. Like, But his whole point is simply that your freedoms and liberties are there. No one can do anything to you without your own consent. And he said it right in there. We've talked a lot about removing your consent, removing your consent. And people call us and they mock and say, Rah. right, well, so just not doing any, removing your consent is going to do anything. Yes. It's not simply taking from your master, but not giving to him. Not making them your master in the first place. Exactly. So these rich elites, these people that are ruling us, that we're all afraid of, why? Americans alone are 300 million strong. Who can tell us what to do without our own consent? Who can force us to do what without our own consent? Who can force you to do anything without your neighbor being the arm of the government to force you to? Or, or more pointedly, without you being the arm of the government against your neighbor. Right. Who can spy on you without your neighbor's own eyes? How can your neighbor be spied on without your own eyes spying on him for the state? And I, and I think that right there has to be the real question, Josh, because I can't control your actions. Mm -mm. I, I, can't, I can't change your heart. 
I can't make you into a good person or a kind person or a person who minds his own business. But I can with myself. I can choose to mind my own business instead of sticking it up in yours. I, I, I can choose not to call in and report on you because you've got dark smoke coming out of your chimney. Be the change you want to see? I've heard that before. Who was that? Is that Cecily who called in saying that? No, there was a, Once I, a great thunker of past times. Anyways, I didn't want to belittle the guy that called, and I'm not by any any way doing that. I'm just asking these people that we're so worried about, what exactly can they do to us without us doing it to ourselves? Seriously. I want got to find out who said that now. It's driving me nuts. How do they how do they get our taxes, Josh? Don't we voluntarily Right. Send it to them? Sure we do. And yet, how many people, if you don't, Aaron Burr, be the change you want to see in the world? So if you don't pay your taxes, though, how many people freak out because you're not paying your fair share? And why is it that they're worried about you paying your fair share? Because they're not brave enough to not pay their own? I'm thinking maybe they aren't paying their own fair share and they're trying a little bit of misdirect. Usually. But the point being... There's really nothing to fear except for ourselves. Even then, we shouldn't fear anything. But there's nothing that these global elitists can do to us without us consenting to whatever they do. I mean, we think about Department of Homeland Security bought 2,700 armored personnel carriers. So, they bought 1.6 billion rounds where they could shoot each one of us six times. Each American they could shoot like six times. So, what really could they do without our consent? What could the Germans have done to the Jews without the Jews' consent? Six million Jews? What kind of revolt would there have been if six million Jews simply put their foot down and said, no, I'm not getting on the train? That's exactly it, not getting on the train. Why did they get on the train? They gave their consent. It's all about consent. When you watch the old movies or see the old pictures, you have four guys with rifles, bolt-action rifles that carry five rounds in them, and they have 600 people or 1,000 people that they're loading onto a train. Was it because if they were so powerful that they could have maintained these thousands? Sometimes it was thousands. I mean, I, I've never actually counted pictures, but you can see the guys with the weapons. There's very few but these people are in servitude, and they're giving their consent to get on the train. What if they just turned around and said, nope, not getting on the train? What would the guy do? Well, I'm going to shoot you. Say, okay, you got five bullets. How many are you going to get? Probably the German officer or soldier, whoever he was, would more than likely, well, if he did start firing, he'd be dead. Or maybe he'd just put his gun down and say, you know, a good day to retire for my military service today. And yet that whole thing was all about consent. Millions of people died in Germany based only on their consent to willingly die. Hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of millions? Yeah, 300 million. So hundreds of millions of people in America are subjected to servitude, taxation, humiliation, TSA, um, Deprived of liberties, rights, beaten, ridiculed, made fun of. That's well, the same thing. Simply off their own consent. What could the goons in D.C. or the goons over here at the borough building do without our consent? There's like nine borough assemblymen. They have no police powers. There's one mayor. He's a goober. I mean, what can he do? We worry about the uh, wood smoke issue. We've got to pass some laws to protect it. We've got to give the state control. We've got to blah, blah, blah. What, what would they do if we just said, no, I don't give you consent to do anything to me? What if all the wood burners in the interior just collectively, I hate the word, but as a people just said, no, we're going to burn wood. Come and take them. Wouldn't happen. 
It's all about consent. We have nothing to fear. Come back to Nottingham. Here this is hour one of Patriots Lament. We call it the Saturday morning wake-up call. And after that uh, first half an hour there of serious brain power being expended, I'm almost ready to get back. I'm burned out, man. Do you want to go to the phones? Yeah, let's take... Oh, we've got two now. Four, five, eight, talk. No, just one, really. One one, and give enough. Good morning, caller. (laughs) Who's this? This is Hill Billy, man. Hill Billy, how are you doing today? Hey. Oh, by the way, thank hey. you for the uh, the jam. Yes, I just you beat me. Oh yeah, yeah. thank You're you. Welcome. You got jam? We you got, got a jam too. Sure did. Oh, we each jammed to jam. some jam. No, nice. <laughs> yeah. appreciate it. So I wanted I wanted to pick up where you left off and go a little further because we've had our disagreements on some of these issues, but you're starting to sound more like me. Here's my thought. When it comes to the fact that if the Jews had all put their foot down, obviously the Germans would have run away and gotten back under their rock or wherever they came from. The question that each one of us has to face is, if they are now rounding everybody up, I mean everybody, you're in town, you're doing your shopping, and they're rounding everybody up in Fairbanks, are you going to get on the train? If they say, we're just taking you out of this area because... There was an alien craft crashed, or there was a nuclear holocaust up on the North Slope, or there's methane gas leaking and it's no longer safe. Whatever reason they give you, when they tell you to get on the train, will you get on the train? Or when the police officer says, get out of your car and put your hands behind your back, everybody who's ever been cuffed knows that feeling. It's too late now. The moment he snaps them cuffs on, you are now his property. So the question is, are you going to do it yourself? And my, my point is this. If you're not going to take the mark of the beast, if you're not going to get on the train at that last moment, if you got the, the, the stomach for it and you, at that moment you're going to stand up and take a bullet before you submit, if that's who you are, then you might as well just quit now. Quit submitting to him now, in every way, in every way. And that's the decision I made in 1978, and he, that's the interesting testimony. Is that, you know what? They never did come get me. They never did put me in prison. So, yeah, on, on a major level, if everyone stopped submitting to the income tax, for example, just to pull one out of a hat, they couldn't do anything about it. But even individually, if you stop paying taxes... Unless you're making so much money that you're worth coming to get, or unless you make a stink and they have to find something on you, chances are you won't ever be audited anyway. Mm -hmm. And if you are audited and you just ignore them, chances are they won't even come get you. You know, when you you brought up the thing about the uh, will you step on that train, I think, and someone has wrote me about this, and I agree with them, the problem is no one wants to be the first mover because they're worried they may be the only one. I know, but that's what you have to do. You have Absolutely. to meditate on that moment. If they come out and they say cash is no longer worth anything, everyone has to go and get a chip in their hand in the next week, and then your cash balance from your bank will be transferred onto that chip, and you'll be given a bonus of $5,000, blah, 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 because you're going to, we're going to institute this new system. If they do that, Will you take the chip? You've got to decide. Now, that's the whole point, is, is the idea of saying, I wouldn't go that far, but I don't know exactly what my line is. You have to know what your line is. You have, to, you have to face yourself. If you would take the chip, well, then I'd quit listening to the to 660 altogether, and I'd just go, eat, drink, and be happy. Tomorrow you're going to die. <laughs> You know, Tim- Timothy, I, I think you said something that my, my brain can't get quite past. I've been chewing on it since you said it about getting on the train. It seems to me that so many of us get on the train a little bit every single day. Well, it, those that have a job do. Those that allow anybody to pay them on a system where they pull money out and give it to Uncle Sam first. Yeah, you're already in the matrix. You're already there. You're getting on the train every day and going to work. You're a wage slave. If you do what you do for money, my daddy used to say that that's the definition of a whore. It's somebody who does what they otherwise would not do, Mm. but they'll do it for money. And it doesn't matter what it is you do. 
if that's your attitude, my dad would call you a whore, and he was a Christian preacher. Well, the Bible uses words like that, the whore of Babylon, right? That is the essence of whoredom, is doing what you would otherwise not do. But okay, I'll do it if you pay me. I don't care if you kill a man, spread your legs, or plant corn. If you otherwise wouldn't do it, but you're doing it for money, then it's the same thing. That's why they call you wage slaves. And I, in 1978, I said I won't be one, and I've never been one. And all I'm testifying is, you actually can get away with it. But you have to be willing to die. That's what picking up your cross for Jesus is all about, is to stand up in the morning and say, I will follow Jesus even if they kill me. So all you got to do is say, look, Jesus don't want me working for the man. So I won't work for the man today, even if they kill me. Jesus don't want me, personally, I'm talking about me now, with a picture ID or a social security number. I won't take one. I won't have a TV in my house. I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a hardcore Missouri Pentecostal, and they understand me there but they don't understand me here. But I won't do it even if you kill me. I already made that decision in 1978. I won't take health care. I won't buy insurance. If I buy health insurance, Satan now has the right to make me sick. And I'm not talking about anybody else. I'm talking about me. I can't buy health insurance or I'll go to hell. So I won't take health insurance. I don't care if they put me in prison or kill me. I won't. That makes me a very convenient patriot for the patriot movement because I'm totally committed. But people don't have the personal integrity. I've said that over and over, too. They won't pledge their fortunes or their lives when it comes down to it, and you know they won't, and the way you know they won't is because they don't pledge their sacred honor because they ain't got any. That's the first step to personal freedom is to retain and regain your sacred honor. What is sacred honor? I this is I remember the phrase as a child, reading that and, and thinking to myself, man, that's a really neat idea, well, but I've never heard okay. anybody really explain what sacred honor is. How do Very you pledge simple. your sacred it, honor? Everything is literal. Sacred means coming from God. Honor means you do what you say. So you do what you say with that power that only comes from Him. That's why I can say, I won't hurt you. I will not shoot you even if you're going to shoot me. Even if you're going to beat my children to death, I won't fight you. That's my honor. My word is my honor, and I don't have that power in myself. I have it from God Almighty, so it's sacred honor. That's my sacred honor. So if I pledge my sacred honor, and I say, yeah, let's go fight that if that's what you're going to do. Well, then they pledge their sacred honor to do that. I consider that to be wrong. I wouldn't do that myself. I have other ways of fighting evil than that, and I think they're better than guns and bombs, and they've worked for me. But that's your sacred honor, is say, I'm not going to cooperate with this system any further. I'm going to detach from Babylon. I'm going to leave the world. And if they kill and get me, then they come and get me. If they kill me, they kill me. If they take my kids, they take my kids. But I won't serve Babylon anymore. And if you do that, the world will hate you, just like Jesus said they would. But Jesus will protect you, and my testimony is he's, he's kept me and mine safe. They never took my kids. I had to run in the night a few times, but they never took my kids. And I'm now getting ready to run to the woods. You may never hear my voice again. I don't know when I'm going. But this, all these problems coming up. The draft is coming up, and they're going to. Obviously, with my life, I've already had since 1978 this many years of anonymity. No way I could even go back to Babylon now if I tried. They'd want to know what the hell happened to me for the last 30 years. <laughs> so it's already. I've already gone that length where I've, I've sealed my testimony, and I could either run for my life or I can martyr myself. So I'm moving on, and it's not a matter of fear or anything else. It's a matter that I think there's a whole bunch of you all are going to run with me eventually, and there needs to be somebody out there that can feed you when you get there. So if you care about these things, if these things move and affect you, you should at least try to get to know me and me closely enough that you know where I'm going. There's ain't going to be too many people who know. Hmm. I've been babbling. I'll let you go. Hey, thanks for the call. Appreciate it very much. 458 Talk is the number if you'd like to call in and participate in the show today. Josh, ready for another call? Yeah. Good oh. morning, caller. Who's this? This is Winston. Winston, what's on your mind today? Morning. Uh, yeah, uh, I just appreciate, uh, 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 you know, uh, what's going on. Uh, uh, Timothy, uh, I, I've got to digest some of what he had to say, uh, but... Uh, 
the seller being 22 years old, uh, and, 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 and right now, he probably started discussing this. I mean, the, the, he, he'd been discussing this stuff for 10, 12 years. Exactly. I'm glad you brought that uh, up. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, if, uh, if people let these, let the kids sit around here and, and, uh, uh, and they get hooked up in these little, uh, uh little kids societies, uh, uh, uh where all they talk about is each other and uh, 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 their school indoctrination and stuff of that nature. I mean, if if they don't discuss anything any higher than, uh, 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 you know, how high uh, uh, some girl's skirt is above her knee, I mean, uh, uh, they never, they don't develop anything. They have no basis to it. Public education, I mean, where you have... 12-year-olds talking amongst 12-year-olds discussing what 12-year-old minds know. What education is there in that? Right. Of course, and that's what we get told that it's, well, it's necessary. I'm talking about socialization. Oh, right. You can't you deny your kids. You need to socialize with children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I always figured that a, 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 a kid is going to be a kid for, at the most, uh, uh, 16 years. Uh, they're 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 an infant before that, and after that they're supposed to be an adult. Uh, uh, if you want them to socialize, let them socialize with adults because that's where they're headed. Yeah. Uh, 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 let them take on adult uh, 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 take on adult thoughts and responsibilities, and and expect it of them. And they'll uh, they'll they, they'll come up to the line. But if you expect them to be a kid, a, a, a teenager, the United States invented teenagers. Uh, if you expect them to be uh, 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 immature kids, and, and te- they're going to be immature kids and teenagers. It, uh, it goes beyond that, though, Winston. I mean, look at how many of those teenagers never really grow up. Look at how many people in their it, yeah. 20s and 30s now that are still living with their parents. Oh, yeah. Failure to launch, man. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah it's like I say, you have to, you know, raise them as an adult, and they'll be an adult. Well, it's uh, 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 a lot of these. A lot of these things are sometimes simplistic and 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 in seeming, but uh, uh, if if you work at it, it can all happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, I'll let y'all go. Hey, thanks, Winston. No, Appreciate thanks the call. call. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning. All right, we managed to clear the lines, Josh. We are free and clear, and we've got fifteen minutes till the top of the hour. I was trying to. What exactly? When I was young, I did young. You're you're talking away from the microphone and t- toward your phone. You're texting while. No, I'm not texting. No, I I'm trying to think of the what's the verse in the Bible. When he was young, he did foolish things. He's talking about the Apostle Paul. Yes. When I was a child, when I, I was spoke a child. as a child. I thought right. as a child. And when I became an adult, I put away childish things. Yeah, my That's... search wouldn't find it. That's what you're looking for, right? When I was a child, I was just like, Phew. obviously, I have a bad version of my Bible on my phone. Well, you know, it's funny that we have so many, so much technology at our fingertips here. We got the. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my child these childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Yeah, I appreciate what the uh, what Hillbilly was saying, and also the part where he says that's for him. I think we have everyone's got different things they need to be doing right now. There's the feet, the arms, the eyes. I mean, there's also there's that in the uh, you know we talked about that being a tool of the state, but it's also a tool of the body, the feet. Everyone has a different job. Everyone's a different place they are. And if, if, it, if the eye tried to act like the hand, it would be kind of messy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we got a couple lines on hold again. 458 Dog is the number. Good morning. We're still processing a lot of exactly. stuff. Exactly. A, a lot of information this morning. Good morning. Who's this? Good morning. Hey, is this Cecily? Yes. Hold hey, on. how are you this morning? Oh, I'm doing good. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> oh, you know what? It was a gorgeous sunrise. I was out running this morning when the sun was rising. It was beautiful. I, 
I, I had a little bit of a broken heart about last week you told somebody to go for that state job that gives them more money and health stuff. And then I really appreciated the guy afterwards that said about he didn't really need to trade his his integrity for health care for his kids. And and I, I, I just hoped that, had hoped that you had got that message that the same thing as Hillbilly would yeah, uh, said it, that if you do stuff for money rather than uh, you know if you, something that you wouldn't do um, then you're a whore kind of thing and so I kind of had all those things jumbling around with me and it broke my heart to uh, to hear the, uh, your advice to go ahead and take that job and sell himself out because now he won't be able to stand in front of the mirror and say hey I I honor you, you know, and then, and, and, uh, Cecily, if somebody calls in to ask either. a talk show host whether or not he should take a job, do you really think he's asking for my professional advice? Well, no, I don't think the, uh, professional, I, I, I always looked at it on a spiritual thing, but, but, you know, I, I realized that a lot of, a lot of times you say things to stir stuff up and you're not like behind them in your, very own heart on account of, you know, uh, I, 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 I continue to hear you still be an honorable person, but, but that, <laughs> it, that was, it is, that part it is, it is, it is actually, Cecily, it, it is my personal, it, well, it's my goal to make sure that you do not know exactly how I believe <laughs> uh, on, on most issues. What I want to do is get you stirred up to think it through yourself. <laughs> Yeah. Because you know what, if I'm telling you to go out there and go ahead and take that government job, yeah. and I say to you, go ahead and sign up for those government benefits, and everything inside of you says, Don't. No, no, no. Well, then what, what has happened is that you have made your own decision. If you are coming to me and entrusting me to make my decision, with a decision yeah. for you, well, then, then you know what? You deserve that government job, sister. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I agree with that for, for sure. I just... I just th thought I had a. I c came along to know you so far, and then, and when I uh, when I uh, prayed about it, it kind of said that um, that a man was in a position to lead. However, he forgot himself, and 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 so it, it kind of, and at the same time, it was saying that that it's also necessary for a superior man to to um, have relations with an inferior man in order to rise him up all right cecily thanks for the call appreciate it sister four five eight talk mm. is the number you chewing on that josh yeah i was thinking inferior superior what makes a person inferior or superior isn't it your own choice yeah I mean, if you I if you choose to lift someone equal yeah if i lift you up in my eyes as being better than me superiority is just a matter of uh one's own thought, I mean, their own preference or their own personal ideas of what superiority is. I mean, look, we look at the politicians, right? They think they're superior. For what reason? Because we make them superior? I mean, most of them, just like De La Boate, Boate, I think, I, is it Boate? How would you say it? I'd actually have to see it in print. All I've ever it's heard B -O -E -T -I -E. is... B-O-E-T-I-E. Boati. 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 Boah. Boati. Just like he said on there, it's the, um, you know, they, they assume themselves superior. They assume themselves to be intellectually higher, but none of them have anything of their own. That was the whole point in the beginning of what we read. They don't have anything of their own. They only have what they've stolen, what they've taken. I mean, these rich folks in Washington, we think, oh, well, those people are millionaires and multimillionaires and blah, blah, blah. All of it's from ill gain. All of it's been taken from someone else. We still got people calling. What in the world? I was going to read some more, but Four, I guess we'll take the calls. Talk is the number. Good morning. Welcome to Patriot Cement. Who's this? Hey, uh, this is John David. John, what's on your mind? I want to make a comment about the people getting on the trains. Mm -hmm. I just read Rise and Fall of the Third Reich last winter. Mm. And in there, they, they explained why the people got on the trains. The Germans had figured out 
the exact words to say that would lull people into thinking that they were being taken to somewhere where they would be, you know, in a better state. In other words, they were getting out of the, the ghetto and going out into the, maybe, told, maybe I don't know, I think those speeches in the rise and fall, word for word, Timothy almost mentioned it when he was talking about, they'll say there's a nuclear disaster here, so you got to get on the train or the bus. We got to get you out of here. We got to evacuate you to a better place. So the people didn't, you know, they had gradually lost their grounding in reality with all the politics, all the speeches, and all the propaganda to where when they got on the trains, they actually thought they were going somewhere better. And the speech was that the German officers gave was worked out, and it was the same, they gave it to the same one to all the people they put on the trains. I, I, don't, I think it might be in the rise and fall, word for word, but I, I'm not sure about that. Hmm. Anyway, it's, you know, you dumb them down, you keep propagandizing, you take over the media, you take over the government, you know, you take over the government, you take over the media, you got everybody on the same sheet of music, and then they'll just dance right onto the train. And that's all I wanted to say. It's, it's, it was, they didn't have a stark choice. They didn't realize they were getting on the train to the gas station. They were just, you know, they had just been lulled and, you know, and fooled. And it wasn't a matter of courage or anything else. It was a matter of, well, this seems reasonable. Yeah, I think that's what uh, one of the points Hillbilly was making there was the uh, you have to decide now whether you're going to get on the train or not. Right. Because you're getting, it's a long, long train of abuses is one way you could look at it, but it's a long thought process of obedience. It's a long process of consent. You continually, automatically think that, well, if they're telling me to, then it must be the right thing to do. Just like we look on the other side, well, if that person's in trouble, he must have done something wrong. And we just automatically go along with. Okay, well, I just wanted to make that, point that out so that yeah. when people are asked to get on the bus, get on the train, or pack up, you got to leave this area. They should know. Well, look, that. look at how we are right now being conditioned by Homeland Security. Look at how we are being conditioned at the airport. Same look, thing. Look at how we are being conditioned now to accept random search and seizure for the homeland. Look at how we, as Americans, are being conditioned over and over and over again now to turn in your neighbors. If you see something, say something. Right. Well, if people don't know how the the uh, communists and the fascists and all those other ists that took over did it they are going they're not inoculated against that sort of thing people who know history who know how it was done are inoculated but very few people these days know anything about it yeah here's a little phrase that might help ready mind your own business <laughs> works for me hey thanks for the call brother right. 458 talk is the number good morning welcome to the show who's this I'm sorry I had to tell you that superior, inferior men are in your own self in each and every moment. It's not who's, who's outside of you is superior or inferior. It's you in yourself. Just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Cecil. Okay. You know, what the uh, previous guy just talked about is interesting with the, uh, we don't even understand. It's just like we don't understand that we have basically institutionalized the same Fascism. This government mm -hmm. has institutionalized the same fascism that Mussolini did. When Theodore Roosevelt implemented his New Deal, he took it from the book. Theodore or, uh, Frank, or uh, Franklin? No. Franklin. Mm -hmm. They're both jackasses, so I <laughs> get them mixed up. They're jackasses of a different breed, though. Exactly. But the same family. <laughs> Cousins, I believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So when, Franklin so when Delano, FDR, when FDR implemented, implemented that. That was a uh, direct, he took it from the book of Mussolini. I mean, you can read it. You can see what happened. There's there are a lot of, uh, on LouRockwell.com, there are plenty of deals on there. Anthony Gregory writes one of them. I read this morning, who sounds like we may have as a guest next week. Points out, he calls it little fascism in America. And part of it is how we have basically institutionalized fascism here 
no different than the fascists did in Nazi Germany and the fascists did in Mussolini's Italy. So, I mean, along the lines of we have institutionalized corporatism within medical stuff. I mean, you know, Hitler, he, he made national health care an issue. He gave everyone national health care. The, uh, the way that we have business running, I mean, there's the corporate America thing, the militarization of the nation. I'm leaving a lot of stuff out, but we have institutionalized fascism in America now. And when the left calls Bush a fascist, the right goes, ah, that's ridiculous. And then you get the lefty in there and the right calls him a fascist. Ah, that's ridiculous. Well, no, they both are. We're just missing some of the pointers of it when we don't point out all of it. But it's actually the state institution itself in America. It is a fascist state. So should we be surprised if they go along with what we saw from the more notorious fascist states and start rounding it, folks up for it, this? It would be helpful, too. I, I mean, part of the issue here is that we're dealing with a kind of a forced ignorance among the American public. The term fascism coming by way of the Romans has to do with the fact of the fascisti, the, the, the bundles of sticks. It, it's that, that whole point of for the good of the many. <laughs> exactly. When and, and whenever you hear anybody... Should only be worried about the good of the one. Exactly. Whenever the you many hear should be anybody about talking the about the, 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 the good of the public, it's for the public's good... That's a fascist. The only reason you have to bring that up is because you know that you're dictating an individual's life or taking depriving of an individual's liberty. That's the only time you have to say, well, it's for the good of the whole. Why'd you bring that up? Well, because Joe over there is getting screwed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, you got it on Patriots Lament. We're going to take a break here for the Fox News at the top of the hour. Then we're going to come back and take those phone calls at 458-TALK. One line is open if you want to get on hold. We'll get to you in the next hour on KFAR. KFAR Fairbanks, 660 AM. Man, online what? at KFAR660.com. And welcome. Some people you this is Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. Local talk radio, but we are streaming live around the world at KFAR660.com. And we're on your smartphone, too. If your phone is smart, you can get the TuneIn radio app. I was just telling somebody about that yesterday, as a matter of fact. They're like, no kidding. I've got a smartphone. I'm like, well, here's the thing. If you use your smartphone, I mean, I personally suggest, depending on what kind of plan you have, unless you have an unlimited data plan, you might not want to use that feature unless you've got Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is cool. If you can hook into somebody's Wi-Fi, you'll be golden. Go to McDonald's, order a Big Mac. There you and go, to the and show. sit and listen to the show right there on your smartphone. All right, Josh Bennett from Big Horn Enterprises here in the studio with us. I'm Steve Floyd, the man with the face made for radio. Really, I'm just kind of a trained monkey. I mean, this is, and it, even the training's not all that good. <laughs> Occasionally, I just I get distracted. Well, you are and potty I go up. trained. That's one good thing. Yeah, most of the time, as a, as a monkey, you know what, what we monkeys like to do. Sometimes we like to sling things. Are you ready to uh, go back to the phones, or is there something you want to do? Yeah, let's pound away on those three. All right, 458-TALK is the number. you still there, caller? Yeah, I want to fry your brain a little bit. Oh, great. Who is this? You work around... Wait, wait, wait. Who is this? Red. Red, go ahead, Red. Uh, You work around electronics, TVs, our cameras, all microphones, our speakers, all speakers, our uh, microphones. How come you... you uh, swap over and go to a different system on our TV and the radio system, uh, you know, stations and channels. It's 1984 over, isn't it? I'm not sure where you're getting that all uh, TVs or cameras. I mean, it's, it's... You cut out for a, a second. If a TV can project a picture, it can also take a picture of what's going on in the room. I, I don't think you understand how that technology works exactly. Mm-hmm. I got a friend that was a radar, radar electronics technician, and he showed me that a microphone is also a speaker. That also is not he, true. He a, he showed, huh? Now, that's not true, Red. It has uh, to be. It has to be completely. Uh, it, it's it's totally different kinds of technology. It's the microphone and the speakers are totally different. I suppose you could make one like that. I mean, you, you'd have to take it apart and completely remake it. It's like saying that a car is a tank. 
Uh, no, a car's not. A t- I might have some of the same parts, but it, it's co- completely different purpose. I'm going to go ahead and let you go, Red, and move on to the next caller. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? This is Jim. Am I on? Hey, Jim. Jim, Jim you're on. Is oh. this the Jim from Kenai? This is Jim from Kenai. The you're bastion actually, of liberty wait, wait, in I want to know how, you, how you're listening to us down there in southern Alaska. I am listening to you on the web. Sweet. I am using uh, KFAR Local Talk Radio's website. Outstanding. KFAR660.com. Thanks, Jim. Give a plug. Uh, Appreciate that. Well, happy to do it. Um, the discussion from last week, uh, I'd like to kind of pick up if I can. Absolutely. There was um, somebody talking about the money power and how the money power is this huge problem. And this is true, but you have to understand, they have no power without a transmission belt. The belief in the legitimacy of the legitimacy legitimacy of the state is the string which gives them power because otherwise all they have is the ability to create computer entries. They don't actually have, there, there's no way in that for anybody to obey them. Um, so long as you have the state, there are going to be people struggling to get hold of the state to control it. Uh, those won't be honest people because honest people don't want to rule others. And if you want to rule others, you really need to think about what that means about yourself. Mm-hmm. And then if there, uh, this is why any state is the first step to a world state because um, there's always competition between these people uh, to, to grab more and more power. They don't just want money. So if, if, uh, if somebody creates bank entries, how can they force you to accept these bank entries as payment? It requires a state to make a legal tender law. Otherwise, society would just say, we don't value that, we don't want that, we won't accept that in exchange for our goods and services. And what is, what is the unique characteristic of a state is the unique characteristic of a state is to determine what is right and wrong in violation of the moral law. That's, that's really what I think it comes down to. That's even more basic than a territorial monopoly. It's, it's wrong to kill unless I say so. Then it's right. And I, that's... That's ultimately what a state is, and that's ultimately what people want a state for, is they want, they want the state to do something that they know is wrong in their own heart if they do it. But if they get somebody else to do it for them, then it's okay. Is that why they... So that would be basically why they, let it legitim, why they let it be legitimate. Right. Even when it backfires on them, at least they have the ability to backfire on someone else. I believe that's the case. Hmm. That's a sweet point. I'm glad that you, I know that you emailed me that, but I'm glad you called and pointed it out because it's way better coming from you. You know, Jim, <laughs> I, I, I think to build on that a little bit, when you look at when somebody has intention of going and stealing from someone else, if, if, how would you get away with it? If you know the other person is armed, especially, or if you, maybe the other person's even a friend of yours. If you want to get away with stealing from somebody else, the best thing you can possibly do is form a government and then tax them. And then, and then you can get his money, and, and he doesn't feel like you're stealing from him. Not personally, right. There's nobody, there's nobody to retaliate against. Especially in a democracy. Yes. Especially, you know, that goes right along with what we were saying about um, when you see something getting accosted by someone in a costume, in a badge made of tin, you automatically think, well, he must have done something wrong. Why? Why would you think that except for the fact that you've legitimized the state and anything that the state does, well, it must be right because, I mean, are you going to actually delegitimize the state in your mind? Then, uh... Will, Will Grigg has an interesting test for the, the mindset of a person. When you see a cop beating somebody up, do you identify with the person getting beat up, or do you identify with the cop? And that tells whether or not you're a fascist or a freeman. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, I don't know what this does about me, Jim. I was out on a run here a couple of weeks ago, and I saw a cop getting rough with someone, and I immediately ran toward that thing to, to see if the person getting beat up by the cop needed any help. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> And then there's a really good article by Eric Peters on LRC today, because it's always, what do you do? What do you do? And his suggestion is mockery. Yeah. Laugh, or even better, cry, because how can they tase you if you're crying for them? But you do it in a sarcastic way. Yeah, they, there's nothing more that rulers hate more than being mocked. I know uh, Natalie Howard talked about that at the... Um, Borough Assembly, when people come in and do, you know, they mock them or whatever, and it just drives them nuts. How can you belittle my authority? I worked hard to get this authority. 
<laughs> exactly right. I worked hard to rule over you. I sold my soul. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Josh, were you ever picked on at all? Did you ever have a bully in school that, or or in a in you went, you didn't go to the public school, so I, yeah. I doubt if you ever were bullied there. But my mom you, bullied me around. Well, <laughs> out, out, and how about you, Jim? Did you ever have a bully? That you, that you had to deal with in your yeah, life? Yeah, yeah, back when I was in public school, yeah. Uh, how did you deal with your bully? Um, I belittled his intelligence. And because I was something of a smart ass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oops, sorry, a smart aleck. That's and, okay. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that was that, that was what I did. That, that's exactly what I did, too. There was this one kid in particular in high school when I was a freshman who picked on me, and I'm talking about, like, n knocking the books out of my hands, pushing me up against the lockers, things like that. And, you know, I, I didn't retaliate. I didn't hit him. I didn't do anything else like that. He just kept on picking on me and have other kids around laughing while he was doing that. And how I finally got it to stop is I turned it around and mocked him while he was pushing me around. I mocked his intelligence. I mocked his background. I mocked his ability to, you know, to, to carry out a task. He got so frustrated and so angry that he finally, in frustration, gave me a full-fledged soccer kick right to the member. Ow. I doubled over in such pain. I mean, it hurt so bad. But you know what happened? Everybody that had been standing around laughing at me had been laughing at him with the things I was saying. And when he retaliated by kicking me in the nads, they walked away in disgust. You, and um, never got picked on again. You hit him where he was vulnerable, not where he wanted you to hit him. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean and that's, I mean, that, that to me, isn't, aren't people in government basically bullies? Yes. And that's, they would, they want a physical confrontation because that's where they're strong. They don't want a moral confrontation because that's where they're weak. Or an intellectual. Or an intellectual. Honestly. They're very weak there. <laughs> That's Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks Jim. I appreciate the call. 458-TALK is on the Absolutely on the button. It's the legitimacy of the state. When you legitimize them, that's the whole thing about what we read about earlier. It was because you, wouldn't give your, you don't give your consent to anything that you don't find legitimate, right? I mean, if I came over to your house and said, Steve, I'm going to rule you now, and your family and your home, you would think, that's ah, not legitimate. So you would not consent to that. Mm -mm. So why do we consent to what we go? Why do we consent to the borough government? Why do we consent to a bunch of nilly willies over there? Most of them have had government jobs. Because since the we day all they could took a, a vote, job. and they were the ones that were elected. Josh, we it's people. If you participate in the the voting system, you are legitimizing them, and that's what I think happens to people: is that they oh well next time. We have four years. Next time around, we'll get somebody different. We'll get our guy in charge, and then we'll be the bullies. We'll get to tell everybody else how to do it. Yeah, we'll get our John McCain in there, and he'll he'll be better. That's right. Or any, our Lindsey Graham. Any Republican's better than any Democrat, or vice versa, or versi vice. Just a vice. It is all a it vice. Is. Absolutely. Four five eight talk is the number. Back to the phones. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hi, this is Jim. Jim, what's on your mind? Well, I got a, uh, one quick comment mainly, but you boys got me thinking a couple of months ago with all this controversial talk. Uh oh. And um, and I'm a Christian, and I was thinking kind of uh, in that realm of being a Christian. But this is this is the thought I had. If something came up maybe about abortion, but I kind of was thinking, what would what would the Christians that were alive when Jesus was, and then after him, and kind of thinking the Book of Acts type Christians, what would they do this day if they were alive? What would they do when it comes to the government? I feel in certain areas has become so corrupt that they're supporting, like they pay plan uh, give money to Planned Parenthood and stuff. So they're supporting um, sin, unrighteousness, and even criminal acts, if you want to call it. Um, against people, crimes against people, but um, but I believe that they, there's a place where I believe that they would say, hey, guess what, you're not taking my money and you're not going to use it for unjust, criminal, murderous things. I think that they would, um, I think that they would have stood up and said, you're not taking our money, you're not going to use it for unrighteousness and sinful things. And I think they would hop out of, out of the system based on 
similar things like that. But that's uh, a little food for thought for all the Christians out there. Good Anyways, food, too. Thank you. That's, yeah. yeah, that's some good food, just, uh, Jim. Appreciate that. And that's a really, really good question. I mean, people complain about how they're using our tax money for things you don't agree with. How do you draw the line? There are a lot of people out there that don't agree with the wars that we've been fighting. You can't say, you know what, you can have my tax money except for the part that you'd pay on war. I'm just going to go ahead and write you a check for everything else, but you can't have the portion for me that you would pay for on war. <laughs> Same thing with those who are against abortion. You can't selectively say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to pay for the abortions, but I'll give you my tax money for everything else. A at some point, you do have to make a, a decision, like Timothy said, you know, are you going to, and, and, oh, here's another thing, Josh, at what point do you draw the line and say, okay, I'm only going to, to do the absolute minimum to keep me off the radar? I'm, I'm just going to try to slide through. I'm going to do what I can to protect my family from being unduly persecuted. I don't know. Some of it's got to be personal conviction. Personal conviction? Yeah. has to be personal conviction. Wait, wait, Everyone wait, wait. Has are you, are different... you calling on people to take personal responsibility for <laughs> no. their choices? What on no. earth are you talking about? Never do such a thing. Never. Yes. Quite. Yes, you are. Yes. You're That's actually... a really hard question. I mean, with... Uh, Timothy would have an answer. Get off and don't work. Yeah. Stop participating in a, a system that automatically takes your money and gives it. One, one of the things well, we I... We do live... I don't know. One I of guarantee the I that do, the Jews, the Christians at the time, were, they were taxed. I, and I'm sure that their tax money was I used to drag them in front of the lions. Every exemption I possibly can. Well, sure. I, I try to deny them as much tax money as I possibly can at every level. Not just the Fed, but at the local level as well. Anytime there's an exemption that I could possibly take, I take it. And that is just my, that's my own personal way of doing it. Because I, I'm, I, don't, have the, I don't have the pair that, uh, that Timothy has in terms of saying, I will not pay your tax. I, I, haven't, I, haven't, right I, haven't, I haven't gotten there. I might get there eventually, but I'm not there now. It's not your conviction right. now. And I don't have, I don't know, definitely not going to condemn some folks for this conviction or that conviction. It's not my place. Who Definitely. Are you to judge another man's servant? Nope. Well. You can't, you can't answer for anybody else. Only, no. Only for you. I'm only worried about me. Yeah. But at the same time, throw a few ideas out to the general public and have them think of themselves. Well, since we don't have any callers... Too bad for you guys. I'm going to have to read some more. <laughs> I'm going to end what we started with. Etienne de la Boati. Boati. Everyone knows. This actually goes along right with what Jim was saying. With uh, how the state only grows. Like a little bit of a state is a precursor to a world state. And we've tried to point that out to people that say, well, if we just had small government, well, small, the same argument for having limited constitutional government is the same argument you can use for having one world dominant government. I mean, it'd be more efficient. It could probably protect more rights and we wouldn't have these dictators here.